Hey robot makers, how you doing? I hope you have had a good day so far. So do you want to build the world's most advanced slash over-engineered Christmas tree bauble? It has its own built-in web server and can connect to the worldwide community of cheer lights. We've even got our the, the, the creator of cheer lights on the live chat uh, today. So uh, say hi to Hans, everybody's uh, online at the moment. So if this sounds interesting to you, then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Right, let's get to it. So here we go. Oh, what's going on there? I just need to turn my notifications off. That's no good. You don't need to know about my... <laughs> Let's make sure that's all switched off there. Do not disturb. That's what we need. <laughs> awesome. Right. Cool. Yes. So this is all about the world's most over-engineered Christmas tree bauble. So we're going to have a look at what cheer lights are, which is one of the inspirations for this build. We're going to look at uh, Wheatley, the 3D model that I've created for this particular project. We're going to have a look at how the 3D principal parts all fit together. And uh, we're going to also have a look at some of the electronics as well, which are super simple, uh, thanks to Pimeroni. Then we're going to have a look at some MicroPython code and a bit of a demo. And if you're watching this live, we'll also have a bit of a Q&A at the end as well. OK, so let's get over to the... Uh, what it's all about. So what are chair lights? Chair lights are amazing. I only just recently discovered them. They're actually about 11 years old. So yes, this was created and I hope I don't butcher your name now, Hans, but um, Hans Schaller, he created these in uh, 2011 and uh, it's an Internet of Things project. So essentially what this is, is you can build something like um, you can get your Raspberry Pi Pico, you can get um, some LED strips, connect them together and then have the Pico W connect to the internet, connect to a very specific URL to grab a colour. And that colour is controlled by anyone on Twitter and they only all they need to do is just do hashtag cheer lights and then the name of a colour. So you want to check out what the actual uh, colours are that you can choose from. You can head over to the, the cheer lights um, website. And you can uh, check out what they what you can choose from there. You can also send like RGB colors and so on. It's really really cool, and it means that they're all interconnected. So I can see at the moment we've got a, a few different colors uh, running at the moment. So if you want to you want to join in this, you can do hashtag cheer lights and then pick a color, and it'll change in real time. So yes, it's a, a way of connecting physical things with social networking experiences. I absolutely love this project. It's the exact kind of thing that really uh, switches me on. I like this kind of stuff. So. Let's have a look at um, what the 3D printed model is I've created. So I was I was thinking about um, I was actually inspired by Toby from Raspberry Pi. Toby Roberts he he created a, a little tweet this week that had a picture of a, a star with some LED strips, and I was thinking I need to get into the the Christmas spirit. I know it's still November, but I need to start thinking about some projects, and I need to start thinking about what I can do and what I can bring to um, you know <laughs> the Christmas uh, spirit and the um, and, and the maker environment. So I was thinking, how can I make a Christmas tree bauble and how can I do it my style? <laughs> so somebody once said of me, it's actually been said a few times, I over-engineer things and I thought, well, I'm owning this. Let's over-engineer a Christmas tree bauble. So I was thinking about one of my favourite games is Portal and Portal 2. Um, and one of the characters on Portal 2 is Wheatley. It's one of the, uh, the core um, components on there. And... Um, it's an, I think it's an AI character that sort of helps guide you around the, the maze that is Portal 2. I love the shape of it. I love that it's round. I love the complex design of it. Uh, and I was thinking I could probably model something similar to this uh, in Fusion 360. And it's a bit of a challenge. Let's see if I can do that. And so the fact that it's round really works well with the, uh, the Christmas tree bauble idea. And I needed to make it big enough that it could fit inside one of the components I've been playing with recently, which is the Pimroni Plasma Stick 2040W. So I'm going to show you on the screen there. So what it is is essentially a Raspberry Pi Pico uh, that's got some extra bits on it. It's got a Quest connector and it also has um, the this uh, terminal block so you can very easily plug in some RGB LED strips. So what I've essentially done here, if I just put this together just here, this, this is a failed 3D print that I did. It sort of stopped printing uh, for various reasons. So I've got two halves of a failed 3D print. But what this can easily show you on screen um, is just how this thing sort of fits together. So you can see that the plasma stick fits really nicely inside. And we're going to have a cutout at the front here. I'm going to have uh, some electronics go in there, some RGB LED strips. So really nice and easy to design this. I'll show you the 3D model shortly. In fact, I'll show you it now. So it's made up of four 3D printable parts. It's two halves, as you can sort of see on this uh, sort of 
broken version. Uh, there's an eyepiece, so it's a small sort of coin sort of shaped one that goes. There's a little channel in here that it f fits into, uh, which locks everything together. And similarly, on the top as well, there's another little round section and things fit together nicely like so. So I call that the eyepiece. There's the top loop that's going to be um, got it just here, actually. This top loop um, allows us to plug in our USB cable to power the lights and also have something to sort of hold a string by. And the idea again with this is that this can sort of, if I just get the right orientation here, this can sort of slot into the top there and it's, it's kind of keyed in there. There's a little recessed area. So when these things sort of push together, um, it can sort of be held by that. So you can see how that sort of fits together. It's quite a complicated 3D model, actually. It took quite a while to sort of design this, uh, but I wanted to get it just right. And it's round like a Christmas tree bobble. So the left half of it, if you look at a section analysis of this, you can see how all the four parts will fit together. I've even included some screw fit fix fixtures and fittings. So in here, there is actually some round um, holes in there that are basically designed for a 2m screw and you can screw that in through the little recessed uh, areas as you can just see on the screen just about here there's one here and one down here so they can go through and then just sort of uh, stick the thing together what, what i found is when you've actually got these um, these pieces in place it actually push fits together and it's fine there's plenty of space inside for electronics you could probably even fit like a gallium battery in there with a um, a LiPo Amigo Pro as well, but I've decided I'm just going to have these plugged in all the time because why not? It's a uh, Christmas tree lights are plugged in all the time. So the loop piece is very, very simple. Um, I'm, I'm going to redesign this very slightly just to make the opening a bit wider and the loop probably a bit taller just so that I can get the cable to go in nicely in a few different um, widths of cables as well because not all cables are the same. The idea is you can attach some cord, some thread to that, attach it to your Christmas tree. Um, and nobody's actually mentioned about the Christmas tree that I've got in the the thumbnail for this video. I actually have a Christmas tree undecorated outside our front of our house. It's just a, a, is it a fir tree, um, a fern of some kind. Anyway, and yeah, we just use that for the for the thumbnail. Anyway, so yes, you can use some th thread cord to attach to the hoop, to the loop. And then it also has this little, um, I'll put it away now. It's got a little ridge to it just on the edge there that you can see probably a little bit easier on, on here. And this just allows it to sort of lock into place. So the, the top section is smaller than the, the hoop section and, that, and therefore it locks into place when it's, uh, um, it's attached to these pieces here. There we go. And it allows the USB cable to sort of push through the top as well. So the eyepiece, um, this is allowing the LED lights to diffuse. So you can hot glue this, you can blue tack it. Um, and the, the unit I've actually found, um, I've called it an Adafruit Jewel. I think that's the, the sort of proper version of it, but I've got a slightly cheaper version. I think I actually got this at some kind of fair ones, probably the Liverpool Make Fest. So this is a CJMCU-2812, which is the name of the, the driver, dash seven, and seven is the number of LED pixels that are on here. You can see that they're arranged like so. So great little device, very easy to solder up, just three wires uh, for this particular project. And then you can just stick this onto this uh, 3D printable piece so that it can shine through. I've just used a white PLA, that seems to have worked fine. You get a nice diffuse effect. If you've got an infill pattern, you can actually see the infill pattern through the LED lights. It diffuses it along the infill pattern. So I've used like a hexagonal shape uh, and it looks quite interesting. It gives a bit of extra visual aesthetic. So that's the end of part one. So welcome back to part two. Um, so we're going to continue with our Christmas tree bobble project. Let's have a, a look at some of the electronics now. So like I said, this is based around the Pimeroni plasma stick. So I've got one uh, embedded in this, uh, this um, test print that I did. <laughs> Call it a test print. It's a failed print. Uh, but yeah, you can just see there that it's uh, attached. And the orientation is it's actually that way up so that the USB connector can go to the top. And you can see there that we've got uh, three... Um, Screw terminals on the bottom, we have uh, one for ground, one for the 5 volts and one for the pixels and these are out, these are two connect to the RGB LED strip. Now I'm not using strip, I'm just using these little um, Adafruit jewels and the three wires I've just soldered onto the back of one of these three wires, just like a red, blue and 
black wire and then they're just screwed into the screw terminal in the bottom of the, uh, the plasma stick. Now the plasma stick also has a few extra goodies on here. It also has, um, what's it called, a Quest connector, I forgot what it's called, a Quest connector. So one of the things that we can connect to the Quest connector is something like this uh, CO2 connector or um, various temperature sensors. So this is a um, an SD, uh, sorry, an SCD41. Now you can see that it's a CO2 sensor. So if I have this plugged in, I could breathe near it and we could have the colours change depending on uh, the sort of amount of CO2 in the in the air. I was actually thinking of making a 3D printable nose for this. So uh, I might use it on a different project, but we can, we can enhance this even more, make it even more advanced. So it's the even more advanced um, <laughs> Christmas tree bobble. So a few things to note about these Adafruit um, NeoPixel jewels. Watch out for the RGB or RGBW, so that's red, green and blue and a white um, LED that's built into the little LED package uh, and the RGB order. So I've been playing around with uh, a few different LED strips and when we come to the code in a minute, not all uh, LED strips, particularly these ones I've been using, are RGB. They have a different sequence. They might be GRB or GBR or uh, various combinations of that. Okay, so we'll have a look at the next slide. So this is about how we're wiring it up. Like I said, very, very simple, trivial to do this. So it probably took about five minutes just to uh, solder this up. Um, so on the Adafruit Dual example there, they've got the uh, the solder points in the middle. On this one, I've got they're on the actual edge of the device. So you can see they're on the sort of bottom edge there. There's just a couple of solder points. There we go. So it says uh, ground voltage in, ground voltage out. So the in and out is if you have a chain of these, you can solder each of the ins to the outs and you have a whole chain of them and you can individually address the RGB LEDs. We're only using one of these, so we don't need to bother with the out. We just need to solder the out uh, wire from the Plasma 2040, uh, the Plasma Stick 2040W to the in of our Adafruit Jewel. Okay, so what's MicroPython all about? Let's have a look at the MicroPython. So I've done quite a few different projects on this. I've I've created a web server. This is the sort of advanced part of this. There's the Christmas tree I was talking about. Uh, and you can basically just configure the Wi-Fi uh, underscore config.py um, in the project files with your local uh, Wi-Fi SSID and password and country setting. And you can currently choose from three different modes on this. It's a work in progress. So it's not perfect yet. We'll have a look at it in a minute in one of the demos. You can have the cheer lights mode, so it will change depending on what the cheer light co color currently is. Currently green, and um, yep, green. And we also have a spinning light one, and we have an MQTT, so I can hook it into our node red, and then I can control everything. So I could even hook up the cheer lights to control every light in my house, garden, outside, and so on. We have a lot of lights. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the code, shall we? We'll have a, a demo in a second or two. But just before we do that, please make sure you uh, give this video a like. Drop me a comment if you've ever used uh, cheer lights before, if you've built any projects or if you're inspired to do this. Uh, and if you're going to do any sort of Christmas related projects as well. And uh, also make sure you subscribe to this as well. It really does help the channel grow, it costs you nothing. And uh, you'll get more great content, fresh content every single week. Uh, speaking of which, so I do go live every single Sunday at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, GMT, which we are now in because that British summer time and daylight savings is over. So we're synced up again with the with this slide. It's right half the year. Uh, but yeah, make sure you catch that. So welcome back to part three. This is about the uh, world's most advanced over-engineered Christmas tree bauble. Uh, so we're going to have a look at some demo code now. Right, so the first one, let me just get over to Thonny. I'm just going to put it on me for a second while I load up the code here. And then we can have a play oops that's the one I want there right so I've currently got the code just running uh, the chair lights um, code let's just stop that and let's run the very first piece of code which is just called color so let's have a look through this and let's have a see how this works so the first thing I'm going to do is import plasma this is a plasma stick 2040w from Pimroni they have uh, their own libraries built into their version of MicroPython. It's very simple to install that. You can do that through um, through Thonny. You can just go down here, go to configure interpreter. You can install or upgrade a MicroPython. And if you're in the, you have to basically just hit the reset button on the device. And then you can choose the MicroPython variant. And one of the MicroPython variants in there is the, um, I think they call it the um, MicroPython with Pimroni libraries. So that's one that you actually want. 
Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to do. From Plasma, we're going to import the Plasma stick, which it means it knows all about the different connectors and things that it has and all the pinouts I've uh, defined. And I've created a little library that I've just called RGB. So let's have a quick look at RGB to see what that actually has in it. It's just got a couple of functions for doing things like RGB to HSV. So red, green, blue, very, very simple to work with. But sometimes if you want to increase the brightness or you want to cycle around the colors, it's a lot easier to do that with hue, saturation and value. You can just change the hue value or the saturation value to make it more white or more solid color. Or you can change the brightness to just increase or lower the brightness of your LEDs. So often what I will do is I'll pick an RGB color, I'll convert it to HSV, and then I will adjust the V value, the brightness value, just to bring it down a little bit so it's not sort of really, really bright. So this will convert, um, using a bit of math there, um, an RGB value to a hue, saturation and value. Now, uh, I found a bit of a code in uh, a bit of a bug in the code that is in the cheer lights um, library on the Pimeroni um, plasma stick. There is um, the hue is basically returning uh, a value between 0 and 3, 360. And we don't want it to do that. We want it to be between 0 and 1. So I've just had to say H equals H divided by 360 just to fix that. So I'll raise a, a bug um, report about that shortly. Let's scroll down. So then we've got another one, which is HSV to RGB. So it does it the other way around, converts some HSV to the RGB values, nice and simple. Um, and then we have some things like, how do you mix two RGB values together? So you can just do this very simple math to add the values together and then return another value. So if you're wanting to fade between one color and another, you can use this mix uh, to fade between them. And then the amount there is just what's the sort of slider between how much of one do you want? So really, really handy if you're doing some fancy things to do with colors. And then finally, we've got two, which is a uh, hex to RGB. So if you have a hex color, um, like the hashtag, and then it's usually like FF00AB, something like that. Um, these these kind of colors you see often in um, web programming. Um, and also, I think this is the, the value you get returned when you're playing with cheer lights as well from the URL. So you need something that will convert it from a hex value to an RGB. And this piece of code here will do that for you. Uh, and similarly, if you want to convert from an RGB to a hex, then you can just use this function as well. Okay, so that's what RGB does. So I'm using that to, to bring that into my uh, my color. Let's go back here. I don't know why it does that sometimes. Let me just open that one back up. Uh, let's double click on that. There we go. So that's the first three lines. The next we have uh, the number of LEDs. So I'm using uh, an LED stick which has seven pixels on. It's got one in the middle and then six around the outside. Uh, I'm also just having this um, orange color just as a default value just while I'm sort of testing it and then I'm setting up the RGB LED strip and that's specific to this particular um, component so if you've got an Adafruit Jewel it might be a slightly different color ordering than I've got on here I found that GRB was the correct sequence here to make the colors work properly uh, if you use oops, if you use RGB on this the colors will look weird they'll be the wrong color and then you do LED strip dot start to start off the uh, the code. And then if I just scroll down here, let me just move this other little window out of the way that you can't see. And here we have some very simple code. So red, green and blue. We convert that hex value, that orange value that we had uh, above into a red, green and blue. We then want to convert that into a hue, saturation and value using the RGB to HSV. We pass in those RGB values. We can print out what that is, just using this little print statement there. And then the reason I've done that converting is because I want to then bring the brightness down. So I've got a value between 0 and 1. So 0 0.5 is like half the brightness. And then what we have is a little loop that says for i in the range of you know 0 to the number of LEDs with an increment of 1. So that's all in, encompassed in that one statement there. We then set the HSV value of whatever the, the I is, which is the number of the LED we're currently addressing. So we'll start at zero in the middle and then work out our what one, two, three, all the way around and so on. And we're passing in the hue value that we've got from our HSV color variable, which we converted from RGB earlier. We're going to pass through the saturation value, but the brightness, we're going to actually ignore the brightness that we're getting through that conversion and we're going to use the brightness that we're specifying. So if I now go over to this view here, where we can see the screen and we can also see, I've even got the portal colors, I've got orange, we've got blue. Uh, so let's run this code and see what happens. So there, there you go. That's the orange color that we uh, we looked at earlier. Now, if I scroll to the top 
let's just move this down a bit and we can play around with um with those Thonny's got some really weird behaviors when you're doing like a live stream i don't know what's going on there right so if i just change that to zero zero so it should be full red no green and no blue so it should be like full on red so there you go if i change it to the middle one that will be zero zero ff so um, red green the green should be now full on if i run this there we go and then if i do the last two ff so zero 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 ff we should have blue there we go and if we have mixtures of various different things so we have like red no greens but blue what color do you think we'll get we get sort of a magenta color let's try that sequence a nice yellow and let's just try zero zero oops and ff and see what we get then we get a sort of a what's that cyan color so there we go um, right so what i want to do next then that's the uh, the color so let's go back to our keynote for a second so the next demo then is rainbow so we're gonna have a play around with them um, some rainbow effects now so let's go back over to to thonny i'm going to open up the rainbow let me just find that one uh, i think it's actually on the device itself actually let me just stop sure that stopped i'm going to click on rainbows and I'm just going to make sure, just by making this screen a bit bigger, I'll just go over to this view for a second. I just want to make sure that the RGB order is correct. So I think it should be G, R, B. And, and let's change it. Yeah, LED is a 7, so that's good. If I now run that code, we can now see that we have this nice colour cycling effect. I really like this effect. I think it looks quite nice. This is probably one of the ones I'm going to have quite often when it's hanging on the Christmas tree. Uh, so that's the colour. Uh, and let's have a quick look at the, the code itself. Let's have a see how this works. So we're doing the usual kind of imports, plasma, plasma stick. We're also importing time uh, because we want to do some things to do with pausing um, every time it goes around the loop. We set the brightness again to half. We've got the same number of LEDs. We've got these speed and updates included in here. And this is how fast we want the LEDs to cycle. So that how often they change in the colors. The updates is how many times a second do we want to update them? And we're going to use them in a little formula down in a minute when we do a sleep. We then set up the, uh, the LED strip just using that uh, same path there. So you can see there plasma uh, WS2812, that's the type of LED strip that we're using. We're passing in the number of LEDs. Uh, you can ignore the zero and zero on there. And then the pin for the data in data out sorry is there if you're using the other variants the apa 102s are they they have a also a clock pin as well but we don't need that and then the color order for this particular one we're using this uh, grb instead we then start it we we create an offset and then we uh we have this little formula here so speed equals the, a minimum 255 maximum of one and we then um increase the offset by whatever the speed is divided by 2000 and then for i in range whatever the number of leds is which is seven we then set the hue to be whatever the um, i value currently is and it, we want it to be a floating point number and we want to divide that by the number of leds uh, and then we set that value and then this this sleep value here we're basically going to say one second divided by how many updates per second we want to 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 use and that gets us this nicer of effect where it's sort of nicely spinning and um, bubbling around uh, as like a rainbow effect. Okay, let's get back to uh, our slides. So next up is the spinner. This is one of my favorite ones. I created this uh, yesterday. So let's go over to Thony again. And this time let's load up spinner or spin as it says on here. Let's just double click that. I'll just open up the full screen so you can see what's going on. I'm just gonna close it and then open it up again. There we go. Right. And then I'm just going to run this code. We can have a look what this looks like. So what it does is it spins around and each time it goes round, it gets faster and faster and faster. Before you know it, it's going crazy. Uh, it's quite a nice effect. It's also cycling through colors as it does this. So it starts out as red. You can see it's going sort of an orangey color now, yellow, and then from yellow to green and then from green to sort of blue. And then when it reaches a certain number, it'll start again. So it's just an interesting one. And it's just, it's basically addressing each RGB LED pixel apart from the first one, which is in the middle. So because these are arranged in a circular um, formation, if you address pixel one, two, three, four, five, and six, 
you'll get these effects happening. We've got some code that will basically just erase the previous uh, LED value uh, and make it um, look interesting. I think I've actually got a bit of a fade effect on this as well. So whatever the previous ones like halved in value. Uh, so let's have a look at the code on this. So here we go. So we've got the usual importing of things. I'm importing RGB as well. The, the usual seven LEDs, the speed and the updates as we saw previously and the brightness value. I set this to one this time. Uh, you can see there we've got the, the usual plasma um, stick LED strip setup and starting the strip. We're setting the offset similar to what we just did in the rainbow effect. And then the spin code is basically a loop with loops within it. So we're going to set our color to be um, R, G and B. So whatever we're passing into this, it's going to um, put, pack that into a little uh, list there, um, dictionary even. And then we're going to then convert that um, R, G and B into hue, saturation and value so we can play with it a lot easier. Then we've got two loops. We've got one called K and one called I. So K is the kind of outer one, which is going to cycle through. Um, a th what, do I, what do I actually use that one for? I remember now. So we've got an outer one, we've got an inner one, which is I, and then I is the one that's actually addressing the, the number of the LED pixel. And we're changing the hue and the saturation over time there. And we're saying that the previous one, we're basically going to blank that out. So you can see that I've got two calls to set HSV. The first one just says, if I is is uh, is one, so it's, it's not zero, then we, we go to the previous one and just make that black. So it's just going to turn that one off. Otherwise, set the, the value. And then for J in range um, one to whatever the I currently is, and this is the fade effect, we'll basically just do a bit of a, a bit of math here. We'll set the previous pixel to be half um, half the uh, the brightness of the previous one, the same color. And then we do that time sleep updates bits and pieces. And then I've got another piece of code down here, which is sort of the main loop. So I start out with a color red, and then pass that into our converter to get the color. We then set the, the hue to be whatever that color was from, from there. It's a way of just converting RGB colors to a hue. And then I've just arbitrarily said for range four to 500 in steps of 10, increase the hue value by 0 0.01. So it'll very slightly increase it. Um, and then uh, basically just go around a loop, do the spin function. So that's what we, we see on here. We, there's this nice spin effect and as I'm looking at you're looking at it through a camera that's got a certain number of frames per second so after a while it sort of looks like it's um, switching between two of them if you look at it in real life it looks like it's spinning around crazily fast it's really quite cool okay so that is um, the spin one so let's have a see what else we have we have cheer lights so this is what we're talking about let's go over to our cheer lights so um, let's go to me for a second while I switch back over to Thonny here we go Right, so let me just close that code and reopen it. I'm just going to stop that running as well. And I'm going to load up our cheer lights code. Okay, so there's quite a lot going on with this, as you would expect. So we need to connect to Wi-Fi because we need to connect to the, the World Wide Web to a very specific URL, uh, which is the URL for the cheer lights API. So cheerlights.com. Um, so to enable that, we need to, to grab what our current Wi-Fi uh, SSID and password is. We need to use the network manager to help us sort of connect to our Wi-Fi nice and simply. And then we've got these things called um, asynchronous I.O. and um, requests. These are to do with um, when you're connecting to the network and when you're requesting things from the network, from the World Wide Web, um, you need to use these two functions. We've got time plasma, plasma, plasma stick. We, we know what those are. And machine pin, this is because we want to, to actually enable the LED on the plasma stick itself. There's like a tiny little LED on board the, the Pico. It was on pin 25. It's now uh, moved uh, to a different area. And we can address that by just doing machine pin. And then we're importing the RGB library that we built earlier. Right, so here we go. This is the URL we need to connect to to get the last color. So... Um, um, HTTP API thingspeak.com slash channels 1417 field slash 2 last dot JSON. Now this should really be 120. We need to be nice to free APIs. I'm hitting this every second just because I wanted a, like a almost live um, update. So in a minute, if you want to get on Twitter and you want to tweet out hashtag cheerlights space and then a color. So um, 
put it in the chat what color you're going to change it to and uh, and do that and we should be able to see this change in a, in a second so uh, the number of leds is seven the brightness the brightness on this one is a value between zero and 31 which i find weird but this it is what it is um, and then the there's a status handler which basically just tells us this whole block of code basically just says have we connected to wi-fi or not uh, and there's a little loop in here. I've stolen this from Hell's Code from the Cheer Lights um, example on the plasma stick. And essentially what this first loop does is it sets all the lights to white, waits for a very short amount of time, sets them to black, and they'll just basically flash like that until the Wi-Fi is connected. If the Wi-Fi fails, it'll go to spooky rainbows, which is pretty cool. So there's a whole thing there about spooky rainbows. And this is a very similar kind of thing that we've seen previously. So we'll have a look what that looks like. If we do succeed, um, then we'll, we'll have connected and we can try the code which is further down here. So let's have a see and we'll actually get the color that we want being displayed on all the pixels. So the Pico LED is the, the pin that's called LED. And then we set that pin to an out. And then we can use that just to display when we're grabbing the data, make that pin um, high so we can see that the LED comes on, on the Pico. So we're then setting up the uh, LED strip. Remember, I've got the weird order in there, GRB instead of RGB, starting the, the uh, LED strip. And then we've got this try accept block just to see if we can connect to Wi-Fi or not. If it fails, we can do spooky rainbows. Otherwise, we can run this code. So this is how we, we can connect to chair lights and we can set an RGB LED value from a hex value. So we're going to put the, the URL that we defined above, which is that thing speak one, into this R, this request. We're going to then grab the data that's returned from that request into our J thing there. We're going to close uh, as if it's like a file. We'll just close it down. We then say Pico LED value is true and then sleep for a tiny little bit just to make it flash. And then we make it go off by setting the value to false. And then we then extract the hex value which is field two into this, this uh, variable that's called hex. We can then pass hex into our hex to RGB converter function uh, and get an RGB value back. And then we can convert that RGB value into a HSV value so that we can play with it. Um, and then we say for each of the LEDs in our um, LED strip, we want to set um, all of them to those red, green, and blue values. So it looks like I've actually not done anything there with the hue saturation and value, so we could probably rem remove that. I do print out what it is, uh, and you can see that coming through. And then we sleep for whatever the update cycle is. So let me run this, and let's see what happens. So it's grabbed the values. You can see there that we're currently getting a sort of pink color, if I go over here. It's a nice sort of magenta pink color. So if you now hit, um, and you can also see in this skull behind me as well, that's also synced up. So somebody's now done yellow. So we should see the uh, the skull change to yellow as well shortly. But we've seen that the uh, the bobble has picked up that colour and has now changed to yellow. Uh, that one seems to be a little bit behind. I'm not sure what's going on there. Oh, it's changed to cyan now as well. Somebody else has changed that. Awesome. Awesome. So Hans changed it to yellow. <laughs> Somebody else has already changed it to a sort of a blue colour. That it looks a little bit lighter in the studio than it does uh, here. And I've actually turned off the overhead lights. If I put them on, it sort of gets really washed out. But um, if I bring the lights down, you can see what it looks like there. So come on, some other people choose some other colours. Somebody's done uh, green. Let's see if the green comes through. Yep, the green's come through. Fantastic. I can see that. This is so much fun. Now imagine if there's like entire buildings with cheer lights enabled on all their lights externally. Um, I've got some garden lights. I think I've got uh, eight lights in the garden. There's like um, th three rows of two and then there's two sort of up lights either side. They're all RGB LEDs. They are going to be cheer lights. So my garden will be cheer light enabled very shortly. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's so much fun, so much fun. Not sure what's going on with the school, but that's decided to go to blue now. I think it's a little bit behind that one. Uh, I think it must be a bit of a, a delay. I think it does it only two minutes or something like that, whereas this one's doing it every second currently. So, so much fun. I'll, I'll, I'll reduce this back down. We don't want to have this hit every single second. If everybody in the world did this, um, that that think speak uh, API would basically just melt down and it probably just back you off uh, as like a denial service. So uh, we're not gonna, <laughs> not gonna do that. Um, okay, so that's um, chair lights. 
love this so much and i think we'll, we'll have to have han come on the channel and have a, a chat with him about this project i think it's just so much fun so we'll, we'll look at that um for a future a future uh show okay so welcome back to part four we are just uh wrapping up our uh, our <laughs> what do we even call this? We're wrapping up this particular episode with a, a look at how to build the world's most advanced uh, Christmas tree bauble. So we're going to have a look at the web server code now. Um, okay, so let me get over to, to here. And let me see uh, on Thunny. Uh, let me just stop that. In fact, I'm going to go over to this one for a second. And we're going to have a look at the chair light bauble code. I'm just going to close that and open it again because because Thonny's decided to be a bit awkward. There we go. Right, so this has got even more in it than with the previous ones. We thought cheer lights had quite a bit of code. This one has got even more. So we're bringing in the Wi-Fi config. Uh, this is, again, just to connect to the, the internet. Um, similar with these um, uh, async IO and requests, they're just to grab uh, for cheer lights. We're also using Few from Pimroni, which is their really small um, web server library which is fantastic for doing anything to do with web servers we're also bringing in the uh, the templating render template things we can we can build templated html files and have them display on our <laughs> christmas tree bobble which is just nuts isn't it a christmas tree bobble with a web server built in it <laughs> we're going to then bring in machine.pin which is the uh, to switch the uh, Pico LED on off. We're going to bring in the plasma and plasma stick so we can do stuff with the uh, the RGB LEDs. Um, we brought in time so we can do some sleeping and things. Now we're also bringing in something called patterns. Now patterns is simply just all the demos that you've just seen in one file. Um, so we have one for doing single colors. We've got one for doing MQTT broker connections. We've got one for doing chair lights, one for doing that sort of spinning thing. They're all in there. So currently I'm just using the chair lights and the spin one. I've actually created a class for each of them just so that they can hold on to their local variables if they're doing various different um, spinning things and we want to check um, in real time as the user decided to switch to a different mode. We're also bringing in threads. So threads enable us to run two programs at the same time on our Pico. And the reason we want to do this is we want one handling the web page and the web server part. And we want the other one doing the LED flashing part. And we want them to sort of cooperate, but run independently. So this is where this gets a little bit funky and it's kind of working and kind of a bit funky at the same time. And this is because the thread support in uh, MicroPython, I understand, is experimental, and the few library from um, Pimroni uh, is also kind of beta version. So um, it's it's pretty good, but I find that I have a few issues, and it's probably just a combination of all these things together. Right. So let's have a quick look through all the bits and pieces we have here. So I've got this thing called status. I'm going to use this as the kind of switch between what mode are we currently in? Are we in um, chair lights mode? spinny thing mode or something else or mqtt mode we've got the uh, pico led we're just using that uh, for the chair lights bit in a minute um, i've created two classes one called chair light and one called spin they're simply that code that we've seen previously but with just a few local variables just to help us manage that we can have a look at those uh, in a minute and then i've got this piece of code that's called do it so we pass in the led strip we pass in the spin and the chair values that the um, objects that we're currently using and because this is going to be run in a thread we need to do some thread safe things we need to lock and uh, un unlock when wherever we're checking the status because if that status change and we're mid checking it uh, funky things can happen um, we then uh, just print out there's a thread running in the background and whatever the current status is and we set a variable called count to zero again this is just a, um, kind of a work in progress so there's a few funny things in here you might not need Again, we, we're going to lock this. This is one of the areas where I found a weirdness with MicroPython. I'll have to talk to uh, Matt and the team about this. If I access a, a variable status in this part of the loop, in this part of the function, I can grab it. When I'm in the while true loop, if I try and say s equals status here, it doesn't think status exists. And that's really weird. So it should persist within this local function and it doesn't do so this is why i put things into classes to try and make them remember what they what they are and what they have um, we then just print out more statuses we then say um, if the current status is in chair lights or chair lights is the current status then we want to 
do some chair light stuff. Again, we're just locking and unlocking just to make sure things work properly. Um, if the status is spin, then we do the spinny thing. Uh, I've not put them in the lock and unlock on that particular one just because I was experimenting more with the chair lights thing. And then the MQTT one, not really got that one working yet, if I'm honest. So that's why that one uh, isn't included in the, the bit above. Otherwise, if it's just online, then we just do the spin thing. And then we have, we create the D lock, which is this threading thing which enables us to stop a piece of code so if um, if this is running off on the second core we want the first core to sort of not change anything on that variable while it, while the second one is doing something on it and that's what the lock is to do with it's called mutual exclusion uh, mutex so that's what we're using the lock for and then do stuff we're going to start a new thread and run run that um, do it code which is up here on the second core okay We've then got the uh, the status handle that we had before, which is just man managing the uh, the uh, connection um, to Wi-Fi, and then we've got some few pieces of code. So these are basically going to listen on the uh, the browser on the web server that we're running. So if anything gets passed to slash, we can then re re uh, render the template index HTML, which we've got copied over here. Uh, and it's very similar to the Billy Bass uh, fish project that I did just because I recycled that index HTML because it works fine. If we do slash chair lights, then we can set the status to chair lights. We can just, we can print out that the status has changed to chair lights, but we can still just return that regular index to HTML and pass the variable called status. Uh, so we can print that on the, the web page itself. Similar with MQTT, uh, we can change the status to MQTT and then output that there. And then finally with the spin, we can do the same again. We then got some pieces of code, which just, uh, um, it's a catch all piece. If, if you pass it a URL, it doesn't recognize it, it can just return back not found. So your browser actually gets a response back rather than just nothing happening. We've got then got the code for setting up the Wi-Fi, and then finally running the web server. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this code. Now, it has been a bit funky, this one. Like I said, it doesn't always work the way I want it to. So if I click run, Let's see what happens. So it's connecting to the Wi-Fi. It has connected to the Wi-Fi. It's now doing its little count function. And if I grab my phone and I try and connect to the uh, the web page, let me just see if I can get that to work. 1.104. Uh, so can you see now where it says uh, it's rendered the, um, the header, the footer and the index? And I can actually see on my phone that that has actually come through. So I can now change the mode to MQTT by pressing the MQTT button. You can see the status has changed to MQTT. The thing has stopped spinning. If I change the mode back to spin, um, it should then set the mode back to spin. And this is where it gets a little bit funky because I think what's happening now is it's just stopped the web server from running properly. So it's got a bit of work to be done on this one um, and I will get this working eventually. So it's similar to the Billy Bass thing. I'll show you what the web page looks like if I just stop and start this, this code again. Let's just uh, do that. It'll be easier for me to unclick, plug it back in. And Thony sometimes crashes as well, which doesn't help. There we go, right. So let me now just run that code again. And when it's connected, there we go. So it's got the web server started. I'm going to go over to uh, Safari. I'm going to type in 192.168.1.104. There we go. Right. So I can now see this is the web page coming from the <laughs> from the Christmas tree bobble. So we can see that the current color is white, which is it isn't actually doing anything with that current color currently. Uh, we can see the status is online. If I click the MQTT button, we shall see that the status has now changed to MQTT. And if I go back over to that page there, you can also see that the, the RGB LED has stopped spinning round. So the web page does work. Um, it's the code underneath it that actually does the, the interaction between the threading piece and few, I'm not sure if few uses any of the threads as well. Something there isn't quite playing nicely, so it seems to just choke up uh, at that point. So if I go back to Thony, you'll see that it's just uh, printing infinite amounts of that um, status thing on the screen, and we get the little spinning wheel of death, which you can't see on there. Cool, so that's the, um, the web server as it is currently. It's a work in progress. By Christmas, I'll have this working perfectly, I promise you. 
Okay, so um, if you haven't joined me on Discord already, you need to get yourself over to kevsrobots.com slash Discord and uh, just join there. It's completely free and you can join our growing community of people. Uh, it's quite active. There's quite a few people sharing what they're building and so on and also helping each other out with various different uh, issues that people might have. Particularly if you've uh, got any code that you've you've um, got from one of my videos and you've got an issue, this is the best place to resolve it. You can also follow me on social media. So I'm all over Instagram at Kevin McAleer. I'm on Twitter as well. While it still exists at Kev's Mac, I'm sure it'll be fine. Uh, I'm also on TikTok. You can see on the, uh, at the bottom, of this, uh, just underneath me there, Kevin McAleer 6 on TikTok. And uh, we've had a few successes there. There's one video that's got over like 60,000 views now, which is just nuts. Uh, and I think... Uh, it's just one of the robot ones. I don't know why that particular one took off and others didn't, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh, what else we got on here? And um, yeah, if you want to support the show, you can do that by hitting the thanks button uh, underneath YouTube. If you're watching this on replay, if you're watching this live now, you can do a super chat. Let me switch the super chats on so that they actually work properly when you do one of those. Uh, there we go. Yeah, we're all we're all switched on there. And um, yeah, you can also go to um, buymeacoffee.com. So if you go to kevsrobots.com slash coffee, there's a link there to the Buy Me A Coffee page, which some people have really generously done in the past week, and I really, really appreciate that too. And finally, if you want to join the YouTube membership program, there's also um, a monthly YouTube uh, membership that you can join. Uh, and again, that just helps the channel, helps pay for all the stuff that I have to buy to make robots and so on. Okay, so what else we got on here? Of course, the supporters. So... This is a growing list and I'm really pleased that it's a growing list because it just means that we've got more support for the channel. So you can see there we've got um, we've got uh, Schultz Maker, our Schultz Maker, we've got Frank, we've got uh, Dana Hoff, we've got Grumpy Scrampler, we have um, uh, David, we've got uh, Matt Hungerford, we've got Flavia of Dev, Patrick. Our members, we have uh, Chemi, we have Steve, we have Thomas. And uh, YouTube members, this is a growing number of people. So we've got cheer lights, woohoo, thanks Hans. Um, we have Michael, we have uh, Frazier, we've got Bill, we've got Jose, uh, Jeff, uh, Joanne, uh, jo Johan. I'm, I'm not very good with my um, Spanish or Mexican kind of name. So is it, is it Jose and um, Johan? And um, we have uh, John Paul Jolly and uh, we've got Tom as well. Fantastic. Thank you everybody for um, helping me with the channel by supporting it in these ways. And if you want to see your name on the credits here, just head over to kevsrobots.com slash credits and you can get yourself over here <laughs> as well. Okay, let's go back over. Okay, so I think that's everything for the slides. So this is the point in the video. Uh, this is the point of the video where I'll say thank you so much for watching on uh, replay and I shall see you next time.